Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the United States. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us on today's webinar, From Bedside to Classroom. My name is Carolyn Van Oosten. I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Workforce Development at Herzing University. I'm privileged to moderate an instructive discussion presented by Herzing and a dynamic group of education leaders in the healthcare industry. As an accredited nonprofit university with over 70% of our current students preparing to become nurses and healthcare leaders and over 12,000 alumni, we are vested in preparing the future educators and leaders in healthcare. Today, we will discuss the future, what the future holds for nursing industry. You will hear from our nursing guests, speakers, and they will share their stories and insights from their career. Please submit any questions via the chat box and we will direct those to our presenter at the end of our session. Also, if you have any technical difficulties, please go ahead and send a message and someone will attempt to assist. Now, I'm delighted to introduce today's talented presenters, Dr. Deborah Martin. Dr. Martin, she's a board certified nurse executive, a fellow with the American College of Healthcare Executives and an executive with a proven track record in large system change that is evidence-based and patient-focused. She's an experienced facilitator that values teamwork, quality outcomes, and professional and leadership development. We will also hear from Dr. Leslie Kelly. Dr. Kelly's research leads and influence healthcare workforce through the examination of nursing and patient outcomes associated with clinical well-being. Her dynamic portfolio of funded research includes studies on nurse burnout, the healthcare work environment, leadership behaviors. She's also passionate about translating her research and educating future clinicians on the well being through implementing strategies to decrease the consequential effects of burnout. We will also hear from Dr. Brandy Ebert. She is the MSM program chair for the online nursing department. She oversees the RN to BSN nurse educator and nurse leader programs. In addition, she works at various institutions in different nursing education roles, such as faculty, program chair, curriculum and instruction specialist, and clinical learning specialist. Her clinical background is in women's health, and her education background is in nursing education, educational leadership, project management, and biochemistry. Now, Dr. Ebert will provide us with some data regarding our nursing field. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to participate in today's webinar. So as you think about nursing, we know it's a growing and evolving profession. Not only is it evolving in the scope of practice, but also around the track options themselves, as well as the role of the nurse as an educator. The role of the nurse as an educator is a very fast growing and beneficial track as well. So let's consider some of the facts around what it means to be a nurse educator, as well as some of the incentives or rationales that people have reported as to why they want to become a nurse educator. So some of those common reasons um, are that a lot of the individuals who pursue the role of a nurse educator are interested in shaping the future of nursing and inspiring nursing students. Many educators can often speak to a nurse educator that touched their lives or a moment in nursing school that pushed them toward the role of being a nurse educator. By becoming an educator yourself, you can help mold these future nurses, nurses and their role. In addition, the nurse educator can still maintain their role as a nurse, but not necessarily having to change careers. The educator can maintain a role in a hospital or clinic setting, as well as in a more academic setting. There are fellowship ed educators who train new nurses at hospitals. There are clinical faculty as well as didactic educators. Educators can also teach face-to-face -face or remotely. Other voice benefits, and you can see that listed up here, are the attire. Um, a lot of individuals who seek the role of a nurse educator like the ability to have that flexibility or change in attire from scrubs to a more professional attire, as well as the ability to improve the profession. When we think about changing our track or becoming a nurse educator, even if it's not a nurse educator track, just really in general, we also want to consider that path as well as the salary and job prospects related to that path. So when we think about nurse educators, the average salary for an MSN prepared nurse educator as an assistant professor is $78,575 annually. 
In addition, the employment of nurses is projected to grow about 12% from 2018 to 2028. This includes the opportunity for the nurse educator. This is primarily due to a wave of retirement and increases in student enrollment and job opportunities over the next 10 years. Thank you, and I will pass it back on to Dr. Van Roosten for the next slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Ebert, for that insightful information. Next, we will hear from Dr. Martin and Dr. Kelly and how they plan their careers with the end in mind. They will share their unique stories and pathways that led them to the classroom. We'll go ahead and start with Dr. Martin. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I actually began my career at the bedside in acute care, so that's where I'll start uh, with my story. I actually started in med surge as a new grad, and I did that because at the time there were no uh, positions available where my heart was, which was in a newborn nursery. And then within a year of taking that position in med surge, a position opened up and I was offered uh, a transfer to the newborn nursery, which I took. That was actually the reason I went into nursing. It was my passion. I loved babies. Um, I quickly from that point moved into a first level management position in a role which was called an assistant manager at the time, assistant nurse manager. And that was 90% at the bedside and 10% in management. And it kind of gave me that bug for uh, management and leadership. And then within three years, I had the opportunity to become an interim manager as my um, manager was moving on and moving out of the area. So I was able to step into that role knowing she was actually still in town and as a mentor, could I could call her if needed. Um, so it kind of made me feel like I had that security blanket, if you will. But then I realized I really liked uh, management and leadership and I liked being able to influence um, bedside care in a different way by ensuring that the staff that were taking care of those patients were the best that they could be. So uh, being an interim manager, it made me realize that you should never be afraid of walking through open doors that are right there in front of you. Um, and it's a way to kind of improve your skill set as you go along. And then after I took that interim role, I was actually named the manager within a year and that position then morphed into a director role. In the mid-90s, I actually experienced the first reduction in force in my career uh, with reorganization in that facility, and many of my colleagues were out of a job at that point. And my role was actually transitioned into one that was called a director of nursing financial systems. So again, it was um, an opportunity to step in and grow and do something a little different. I also thought around that time that it was time to get additional experiences. I had been in the same organization for about 14 years. And for me, it, I felt it was important to uh, spread my wings and do something a little different. So I actually moved to the Midwest. I was in West Virginia at the time. I moved to the Midwest um, and took a, a stab at a new role that expanded my role from nursery and postpartum to antepartum and uh, pediatrics. And so I was a women and children's service line director at that point. And then I was recruited to another hospital within that area where I again just continued to expand my, um, my service areas. And it included um, opening a tele unit, an adult tele unit that was an overflow unit in that hospital and it was open Monday through Saturday. So that was a whole different experience that I was able to do. And then I met a man on a blind date. I was living in, in uh, the Midwest. He was living in Arizona. We actually dated long distance for a while. And then when we got married, I decided I should probably move to Phoenix. So with that, um, my career took a little different trajectory. I had been in operations up until that point. And then I was offered a position in Arizona with a large healthcare system where I was initially the director of throughput and then from there became the director of professional practice and education. So that was the how we do as opposed to the what we do in nursing. And all along those uh, points, it was continuing to, to grow and develop and step into those positions that um, are progressive and additional interim positions along the way, which included um, actually director of a, an ICU and adult ICU and some others that really stretched me. I always had an, uh, an idea that when I started my nursing career, I wanted to retire or do something different at age 55. 
I knew I didn't want to be at the bedside at age 55, and that's perfectly fine for some people, but for me, that's not what I wanted. So moving into that uh, first manager position was that first step in doing that. And then uh, leadership positions uh, in acute care can be stressful. So as I continued my career with that, I also realized that maybe 55 was not the time for retirement, but a time to reinvent myself and do something a little differently. But financially, could I do that? So one of the things I would recommend is with that end in mind, think about what you need to be doing to position yourself financially to be able to do that. Um, if you take a, a high uh, level director position and then move into a faculty role, uh, whether it's part time or full time, the financial um, incentives to do that may be a little different. So you want to make sure that you are prepared to be able to take that initiative on. So I would recommend a certified financial planner to help you with uh, planning for your future. And of course, take advantage of any matching contribution to your retirement accounts. That is the best way to double your investment, if you will. And again, I mentioned interim leadership several times. Uh, take those opportunities to do things in a safe environment with support from your leadership. Um, when I was in Arizona, I actually co-authored an article about um, do you have the talent within? And that's kind of a play on words. Do you have a talent within your organization to have interim leaders? And do you also have the talent within yourself to become an interim leader? And that way you can just, like I said, explore new horizons and expand your skill set while you have that support of um, your organization behind you. Then from an educational perspective, I actually started with a bachelor's degree, so I didn't need to start um, you know, going back to school initially to complete my bachelor's degree, I started with that. And I wanted an MBA because I was in leadership and management positions. I felt I needed to be able to speak the language of those finance guys, those suits. Um, but my uh, leader at the time said, no, no MBA, you need to get a master's in nursing. So I did that and I was actually very uh, appreciative of that because I do appreciate that master's in nursing. And then later, a couple of years later, I had a different leader and they said, absolutely, we will support you getting an MBA. So with her support and tuition assistance, I then um, got my MBA. But I always wanted that doctoral degree. I wanted to be called Dr. Martin. So I uh, searched for different degrees that would be, uh, I thought would be worth my time and effort. And I actually found at Arizona State University a, a DNP program in innovation leadership. And so I completed that and actually looked at uh, shift, shift length and nurse fatigue. So again, still looking at that practice environment and what does it look like for our nursing staff and how does that impact patient care at the bedside. And then I wanted to get that side hustle, as it says on the slide. Um, along the way, if you're thinking about what do you want that end to look like, make sure your resume is being built to have that end in mind be reachable uh, at the time that you want it to. So if I wanted to reinvent my career at age uh, 55, I needed to think about what that would be. And throughout my career uh, in all those different states I lived, I had associations with universities, be it adjunct faculty, um, et cetera. And I used that to mentor students, to co-teach courses, to really kind of get my head in the game around what does it look like on the university setting. And then also in my doctoral program for one of my electives, I took an education course uh, so that that would help me also prepare for if I wanted to become faculty along the way. Then I also uh, became a magnet appraiser uh, with the American Nurses Credentialing Center and the a work with the ANA. Um, that also gives me freedom to do magnet work, if you will, along with teaching work. So it's two different uh, side hustles that can then prepare you for what you wanna do down the road. And you can kind of do those at your own pace. So you may not um, do any of those three things, your regular job and your side hustles uh, full time, but it's, it's preparing your resume so that you're ready when the time comes. My current situation is that I changed employment about five and a half years. There was a change in my employment about five and a half years ago, and it gave me an opportunity to adjust my focus at that point. 
So what I did, since I already had uh, those side hustles in place uh, with the magnet being a magnet appraiser, I was able to increase the work with that. And then also um, at the magnet conference, I was able to meet with the Dean of the School of Nursing, um, Aspen University, and um, met with her, interviewed with her, and went through that hiring process. And I'm now part-time faculty of uh, it's an online school of nursing, teaching in the master's program. So my side hustles turned into my regular hustles, if you will. And uh, so that's how I went from bedside to classroom. And it's been just a wonderful journey. And nursing is a great way to do all those different things along that pathway. Carolyn, I'll hey. turn it back to you. Thank you so much. Deb, for that insightful information. And next, we'll hear from Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Carolyn. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today and talk to you about my story. And, um, you know, as we prepared this, I really kind of thought where I've been and where I'm going, it all has a central theme. And that's how I can make an impact as a nurse. And I think a lot of us feel that way. It's a lot of the reason we want to go to nursing school or we became nurses. And so, a lot of my story has to do about making decisions and picking um, positions and opportunities that help maximize that impact. And so my journey um, started with the uh, bachelor's of nursing degree as well at the University of Arizona. And I tease that I wasn't the best student, not for reasons um, of being a poor student, but because my head was always um, thinking about the unit and thinking about the perspective of how the unit was run. And as the slide says, a lot of that comes from my mother's influence, who my mom also happens to be on this call. Hi, mom. I'm <laughs> still helping and mentoring and supporting me today. Um, but my mother uh, was a CNO and an administrator and everything in between director. And uh, that was my perspective growing up. I uh, got to see how units were run. I got to see staffing. We used to make a joke in our house that even the dog could calculate hours per patient day and help find staff nurses. Um, so we had a lot of influence uh, looking at that perspective growing up. And so when I went to nursing school, um, that's kind of where my head was. I was thinking about, um, you know, the charge nurse and the questions and how to make the unit more efficient and, um, you know, not always what my instructors wanted me to do. But with that in mind, um, you know, I knew I would be doing something different right from the start. And uh, I also was able to see uh, my mom going back to graduate school. She started a PhD program while I was finishing my bachelor's. And so speaking to her and her colleagues, um, I really got to learn what that was and why we have nurses with PhDs. And for me, um, it matched my brain. You know, my brain was very analytical. Uh, I thought about researching problems and taking that perspective of um, understanding a healthcare issue and thinking about the evidence associated with it and how we get better outcomes. And then especially for me, uh, that impact happened to be not just about our patients and our patient care outcomes, but I always say my passion in nursing is the nurses. And so for me, I was really interested in, uh, you know, the the um, care our nurses could provide, how they could be efficient in hospitals, and then how they take care of themselves. And that really led me into a career of looking at clinician well-being, burnout, and healthcare outcomes associated with um, how our workforce, how we care for our workforce. So right after my bachelor's degree, I went straight into a BSN to PhD program. Like I said, it really met my career goals and gave me the opportunity, but I did choose to um, continued clinical work that whole time um, on a tele unit and a cardiac care unit and keeping um, up with my skills and um, being part of the workforce. And I think that's a decision that, um, you know, we, we have to think about as we go to school and making that balance. And I was very blessed and fortunate to be able to sometimes go part time or, um, you know, take a position that supported my schoolwork. Um, as I went through the program, uh, just like when we finish any kind of schooling, we are a novice and we have to question if we really know what we're doing. And when I finished my PhD program, having, you know, those, those shortened years, I, I knew that I needed some more training. And so I made the decision to do a postdoctoral fellowship. And that was a real opportunity to increase my skills, learn more about methodology, um, lots and lots of statistics training, but really also learning 
how to be a team member and how to do that work and that job in that preceptorship environment. Just like we get when we become a nurse, it was the opportunity to do that as a new researcher. So I was very fortunate to have that time to learn to be a researcher. When that time um, was up and it was time to move on to a position, I also had the influence of a, a spouse and a partner who helped make the decision that we were coming back to Arizona and uh, we were going to live here. But I was very fortunate to find some positions that interest me. And at the time, a large health system had put out a position for a part-time researcher. Um, and, and I took that opportunity and it wasn't quite exactly what I wanted. So I uh, started asking and really, you know, I've given this advice a lot along my career. If you don't see the position you want um, or the position you want doesn't exist, um, ask and create and work to make it happen. And, um, you know, the, the opportunity might not be there, but you can work at it too and, and build that opportunity. And that's exactly what happened for me. So I was able to um, take a half university position and a half um, research position in the hospital. And it worked well. Um, for quite a while because um, they aligned very well. Like I said, my passion in nursing is the nurses. And so my goal was to always have that foot in a door at a healthcare system where I could be immersed in my research and working with um, you know, the population that I was there to study. So as that still somewhat novice researcher, um, you know, I, I took on these positions and I stayed between the university and the uh, healthcare system in some capacity for almost 10 years. And the goals in those uh, work were to do research. Research, you know, is the main component, but I was able to approach it from a couple different ways. Um, and then support um, the nurses in the hospital who were doing research as well, which was a great way to not only build my skills, but to build up um, our research capacity and our evidence-based practice within the facility. Um, teaching is a large part of being at a university and it was such an opportunity to be part of students' lives and be able to work with that. And then um, what we call scholarly activity too. So serving on committees and building curriculums and working to improve the university which I also did on the hospital side as well. Council, building our evidence-based program, um, lots of different opportunities to support using the skills that I had learned through um, my research degree. So now um, as, a, as a nurse scientist with a very large healthcare system, I had to make a decision on um, you know, what my next opportunity was. And I honestly never thought I'd leave the university. I, I loved my position and I was very happy there, but an opportunity presented itself to me, and um, I was um, asked to apply for this position where I could expand uh, the work that I was doing. So I was with a pretty large healthcare system, and I was, um, you know, the opportunity to be with a very large healthcare system was there. And that decision making for me went um, right back to where I started. How can I make an impact? And when I look at the opportunity to be within a healthcare system, um, and working with nurses and data and the ability to do research with a very large healthcare system, it actually ended up being a pretty clear decision because I think about the skills I've learned and where I'm supposed to be. And um, it worked out well that, um, you know, my research aligned with what a organization was trying to do, just like I was trying to do at the university. And now I have a lot of support to do that work. Um, you know, since the pandemic started, um, the work of myself and others has been very important to not only do the research but apply what we've learned in helping support clinician well-being and decrease burnout um, and and help with secondary trauma and those activities that that uh, keep our clinicians in their positions and help support their mental well-being so i'm very blessed to be in the right place at the right time and you know, I don't know where the end will be. I don't know, um, you know, if I'll return to a university and teach or if I'll continue in this role, but I think that that guiding decision of where and how can I make an impact will always be guiding me throughout my career. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Martin for sharing your paths to nursing. And next we'll hear from Dr. Ebert. She will provide us with an overview of the programs that could help you decide your pathway. Dr. Ebert? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Van Oosten. So on the slide, you'll see a few different paths here. Um, there are paths that show different entry points for starting a career in nursing. 
So you can start by earning your diploma in practical nursing and becoming an LPN, or you can start by earning an associate's or bachelor's degree to become a registered nurse. For those who hold a bachelor's degree in another field, such as a liberal arts degree, um, you might be interested in our accelerated BSN from Herzing, which may allow you to transfer in credits from your previous degree and start on a faster path to your career as a registered nurse. We also have an RN to MSN program for those students who have an RN license from a diploma or an associate's degree program who are wanting an MSN without a BSN stopout. And of course, Herzing University also offers our master's programs in nursing. Our different tracks include the Family Nurse Practitioner Program, our Psych Mental Health Nurse Practitioner Program, as well as the Nurse Educator and Nurse Leader and Administration Programs. So we have many paths for you to move forward in your nursing career. There are so many options available to you, and I encourage you to make every experience count in your life. Thank you again, and I'll pass it back to Dr. Van Oosten. Thank you so much, Brandy. So now let's go ahead and move to the Q&A section. And thank you in advance to Rodney, who has been behind the scenes working the chat, and now we'll direct your questions. Please note that a copy of this presentation will be emailed to all participants, and any unanswered questions will be responded to in a timely manner. Rodney, do we have any questions? Our first question is, how do you know when you're at the bedside, is it time for you to move on to an increased responsibility position or move into a training or education position? Well, this is Deborah, and I, I would say your gut is your first instinct. Uh, listen to what your gut is telling you. If it's telling you it's time for a different experience, then I would listen to that. Um, and also be thinking about what that may be, whether it's education or moving into um, a faculty role. One of the things to consider is if you're at the bedside and you want to dip your toes into that academic world, if you will, is to consider being um, an instructor clinically, be a clinical instructor for students on the unit where you're currently working and you are have expertise in that. One of the things that I was struck by as Dr. Kelly was talking is that she went from a BSN program directly to a PhD program um, without going the master's route, which I did two masters in between there. And I think it's also important for nurses not to feel like they need 20 or 30 years experience before um, they decide they want to become faculty. I think we need young faculty that are energized and out there and not just people like me uh, closer towards the end of their career, but to um, explore it early on and um, and think about that clinical instructor and um, think about if that's if teaching is the thing for you or if you like influencing at the bedside um, or in acute care and becoming a nurse manager and looking at entry level positions there. And a way to look at that is, are you a unit chair of your shared governance councils? Um, are you involved in hospital committees? So those are other ways to kind of put your toe in the water. Okay, thank you. Next question, uh, what is the difference in outcomes between the associate degree and bachelor's degree in nursing if they both qualify you as an RN? This is Brandy, I can take that question. Um, so really when you look at the difference between a bachelor's degree and an associate's level degree, um, first of all, you wanna consider what your career goals are. So an associate's degree, at, when you're actually practicing or earning the degree themselves, there, there can be um, some differences in the focus of the programmatic outcomes between an associate's level degree as well as a, a bachelor's level degree. Your bachelor's level degree tends to have a, a deeper focus on evidence-based practice um, and preparing you for pursuing that MSN degree. An associate's degree, as I mentioned before, we do have a, a direct bridge where you can, or a direct option from an RN to an MSN where we build in those um, evidence-based practice components as well as the community health focus. So as far as making the decision between the two, again, it comes back to what are your career goals and, and what's the end goal for you, um, as well as what's the timeline in which you're wanting to complete these things. So obviously a, a BSN prepared nurse and an associate degree prepared nurse, still you're gonna get your RN license, you're still gonna become a registered nurse, it's just that the programmatic options and the career path can be different between the two. Okay. Thank you. Our next question, uh, does anyone have experience in teaching in the hospital setting 
versus teaching uh, staff? This is Deborah. I was actually the director of education in the hospital setting, but I didn't, uh, I actually supervised the nurses who were doing that teaching, but I would say that's another way to uh, get into the academic world in a way, if you will, to, to build your resume. So think about, do you want to become a CPR instructor? Is that something that you're interested in? Do you want to take on one or two courses that you want to become an instructor for, as opposed to jumping in and becoming an educator in the hospital setting. But if you become a, an educator in the hospital setting, again, that's another way to build that resume. If you're thinking that academia may be the thing for you, you may wanna just um, continue to build on that so that when an opportunity comes available at a local university or college, that you have a resume built that would make you a candidate that they would just you know, be dying to have. Okay, thank you. Uh, for someone who has a bachelor's in another area and are looking into the accelerated BSN program, do you think it's wise to work full time while taking classes? This is Brandy. I can take that I can one. Take, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I'll I'll give the lived experience, Brandy, and then you can share the uh, <laughs> the perspective of um, you know what the school thinks. And I guess I could do that too because I did work. Um, full time when I was taking classes and then I definitely hit a point where I understood that I wasn't able to do that anymore. So I think being dynamic in that, um, you know, teaching for many years, we gave the advice oftentimes to our students to um, decrease their workload and, um, you know, focus full time on school. I think that has to be taken in perspective, um, you know, that you, you need to do what's right for you. Um, but I think the most important thing is making sure you prioritize that education because if you remember, um, you only get this opportunity once and so you want to make sure you're taking that opportunity while you can while still meeting your other logistic needs. I'll hand it over to you, Brandy. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. Um, no, I 100% agree. I, I think it really it depends on you and what what you feel like you can manage. I, I also speak from personal experience. I had a bachelor's degree in another field, and I pursued an accelerated BSN option. It was 10 months. And so because of the timeline of that program and the credit load, I did not work. But at the same time, there are programs that have an accelerated BSN that may be a little bit longer, where maybe initially you could work, and then later on, as Leslie mentioned, you hit that point where it's like, well, maybe maybe I shouldn't. I need to focus on my schoolwork. So I think it does vary on, on student to student. We at Herzing don't have any specific requirement that says, nope, you can't work. You know, it's really up to you and, and your own personal life and your work, work life balance and what you choose to do. And, and it could be a mix of both where you work initially and then maybe you get to that point again where you need to focus in on your school. So, or maybe you go down to, to part-time or PRN wherever you're working. So it really just depends on the, the person. And this is Deborah. I, from my experience uh, with my master's degrees, I got my bachelor's as my first degree. So I was, you know, fresh out of high school for that one. But when I went back to school for my MSN, um, I was single and I needed to support myself financially. So I couldn't afford to, and I was in a leadership position that didn't offer that as a part-time option. So I opted to do school part-time. Um, so it took me probably longer to get my master's in nursing than a well, lot obviously did than if I would have gone full time um, to get that degree and then work part time as um, in my regular job. But then for my, um, my, my MBA, that program was an executive MBA and it was offered Friday nights and all day Saturday. So it was a different um, way of looking at doing school back in the day. Um, I won't tell you what years that was, but it was kind of an innovative solution at that point in time to the you know, regular in, in class during the week um, opportunities. So I actually did, that was considered full time. And so I did that one at the same time I was working full time. And then uh, for my doctoral work, I decided to bite the bullet on that one and do it full time, working full time. And I wouldn't recommend that. Um, it can be done, you know, it, but again, it really depends on you as an individual, um, what else you have going on in your personal life and whether or not you feel you can take on full time work, full time school, or whether one or the other needs to become part time or just focus on one or the other. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is a two and three part question. Uh, 
we have someone that's been an LPN for over 20 years in various areas of experience, uh, designated or destined to be a nurse educator. The individual is about 49 years old and just starting on, on the way to an ASN. Have I waited too late? And how were you able to shift your thinking from the bedside nurse to an educator? I would say it's never too late. Never, ever too late. Um, and I think your schooling and as you're going through your coursework, that helps to um, change your thinking patterns as well. That's what school's all about. It really helps you to think differently and um, and that will get you to where you go along the way. And, you know, there are master's programs that are specifically designed for educators. So as you, um, as you work your way through the different degrees to get to where you want to be, um, think about what your electives are along the way as well. And if you can incorporate educational courses in there as your electives, you know, look into that education school and see if they have courses that would be applicable to where you want to end up. Okay. The next is a funding question. Uh, funding opportunities for those who do not receive financial aid. Does Herzing University provide those types of opportunities? I'll go ahead and answer that question. Uh, this is Carolyn. And basically at Herzing, there are multiple ways of funding your education. The best way of getting that information is calling in and talking to an advisor because they can go ahead and customize a solution for your particular needs. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, comes from someone that's interested in nurse anesthetists. Does, does any of the panelists or do any of the panelists have information about becoming a nurse anesthetist? Um, only in that my university offered the degree as well. And I think it, again, is about just um, considering that different path and, you know, what's the goals that you wanted to meet. And I think the nurse anesthetist, the clinical nurse specialist, these are great positions. If you're um, really um, enjoying your clinical practice and you want to take it to that next level, and then obviously a nurse practitioner as well. So, you know, with any degree or with any decision to advance your education or change positions, I think it's going back to um, looking in the end and seeing, you know, is this the type of position I'd like to do? Does this meet my needs? Um, and then, of course, shadowing. I did that a lot. Um, you know, I, I tell people a lot, like, my goal in life was to be a pediatric nurse practitioner. Obviously, from my story, you didn't hear anything about pediatric nurse practitioner. I shadowed a pediatric nurse practitioner, and I decided, um, you know what, I can't. I can't work with those parents. Um, the kids are nice, but the parents aren't so great. So I think, you know, you can read a lot on paper and you can, um, you know, understand a position um, of what it looks like in theory. But I think um, taking those opportunities and shadowing people or um, talking to those practitioners or those advanced practice nurses or providers um, to really understand what the position is like is well worth the effort. The next question, uh, I've been an LPN and have been a nurse unit manager and a D or an ADON risk manager. I'm currently in an AAS program. Should I have enrolled in a BSN program, being that I'm I have management under my belt? This is crazy. I, I can take that question. Um, I think in that situation, again, it, it really comes down to what's your your end goal. Where do you where do you see yourself? Um, you know, I, I, I think it, it all comes down to that because the associate's degree and, and the bachelor's degree provide um, the same certification at the end as a registered nurse um, with the BSN degree obviously being a bachelor's and having a deeper focus in, in things like community health and, and evidence-based practice. Um, however, that doesn't mean that having an associate's degree, you can't pursue that BSN. Um, we have here at Herzing, we have an RN to BSN program. We also have an, a direct um, are into MSN, so after you complete your associates, if you wanted to do an MSN, you could do that as well. So there are options if, if you feel like maybe you want to pursue that BSN degree at, at a later time, but that decision is really up to you. Um, you know, having that management experience is a really a great resource and would benefit you in a BSN program, but I don't think it's necessarily a wrong or right or a, a wrong decision either way. So, great question. Okay. Next question. Um, 
I've worked 12 or more years in the public school system as an educator. I do not have a background in nursing. I'm not 49 years old. I will turn 50 in November. Is this a realistic path for me? Well, let me just start by saying thank you um, for being in the public school system. As somebody who has two kids at home for the past few months, um, I truly appreciate um, you know, any work being done in our school system. And I think there's a lot of applicability. So you'll, you know, you go to nursing school and whatever path you choose, if it's a um, ADN or a BSN or even farther, um, I think you'll realize that those skills transfer um, and that, um, you know, becoming a nurse is um, really about bringing your heart to your practice. And, you know, obviously working in a public school system is um, something that helps you connect with people. Um, you know, it has the, the ability to help others. And so I think um, it's absolutely a realistic path. You know, I've seen the theme of age here over and over. And, you know, obviously I started my career early. Dr. Martin talked a lot about how she made those decisions along the way. Um, you know, many in my program when I was going through school and many of my students as I taught at the university started their careers at much later ages and you know they have contributed so much to our profession and they bring such a wealth of experience not just in the roles they've done but also life experience and so I think everyone has so much to offer as we um, move forward in advancing healthcare. and I think if your passion is there um, to to take this route um, you know it, it's wonderful that we have the programs that can get you there in a manner that gives you the most time to contribute. I agree with that. And as a director of a unit, um, if I was hiring for a position and I had candidates that were strictly nursing or they had other degrees and other interests outside and different work experiences, that really played into what are they bringing into nursing that adds dimen dimension and depth to the profession as opposed to all you know is nursing. Um, it definitely brings that variety. And, uh, and spice, if you will, uh, to the unit. So that's always a good thing to see on a resume. Okay, next question. I've just purchased a senior care business and would like to get my RN degree. I do not have my LPN. I work full time and have to do most all online courses. What do you suggest? This is Randy. I can take that one again. Um, so with pursuing an RN degree, there are limited programs um, where the, the whole program of getting your RN degree um, is fully online because there, there are clinical components to that. Um, now, a lot of schools, Herzing included, offer some courses online, so it's more of a, of a hybrid type of approach. Um, so, you know, you have an option as far as getting an RN degree overall, you can pursue a BSN or you can pursue an associate degree to get that RN. And then if you later again wanted to bridge to get a BSN, you could, but both the BSN or the, um, the associate degree program, excuse me, would offer you the opportunity to sit for your, your RN license as soon as you've completed the program. Great question. Thank you. Next question. What is your experience or best practices? when studying for nursing classes? I think that depends on the individual. Um, I know I had my style, if you will, when I was in school, but um, that was also, when I got my undergrad it, degree, it was um, before any online classes were even thought of. So um, how I practice for studying for my classes is probably different than a student would do today. So I think you just have to think about what kind of a learner are you and um, and base it on that. Are you a visual learner? Or are you an auditory learner? Do you need to record things? Do you need to write things down? You know, what what gets it into your brain and um, and do your own figure out your own learning style and go from there. I agree. I think that, um, you know, a lot of us being home um, during the pandemic has helped support uh, our understanding of, you know, how we function best and how we um, are able to accomplish things. And so um, for myself, I went to an online program 
And it used to be that I couldn't sit down to do my readings or listen to my lectures or do any work until the house was completely clean and all the laundry was done and everything was in order. And then I had that set time to work on it. Well, you know, two kids later and, um, you know, everybody home right now, that is out the window. Um, you know, now it's the practice of turning all of that off and focusing on what's in front of you. And so I think the more awareness you have around your style and your understanding, do you seek a lot of input? Do you tend to um, work everything through before you ask the question? So just being aware of um, what works for you and if you have the ability to commit to that. Okay, that, that's that's okay. all of our questions. Thank you so much, Rodney. We really appreciate that. And thank you to the panelists for answering those questions and providing that. And thank you to the audience for providing such insightful questions. With extensive experience in online learning and a long history of preparing nurses and healthcare leaders, Herzing is well positioned to forge ahead and meet student needs and is excited to welcome the new group of students on September 8th. We are enrolling for the fall semester and hope you'll reach out to learn more and see if Herzing is a good fit for you or someone that you know might be interested in becoming a nurse. This concludes our webinar today and thank you again for taking the time to join us. Again, for additional information, please go to our website or give us a call and one of our advisors will be more than happy to help you. I hope everyone has a wonderful day.